Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. I will say this is going to be a bit unusual tonight, uh, but it'll, it'll be good, I believe. Hallelujah. When the Lord tells you to do something, it's an assignment. <laughs> so you got to do your assignment, all right? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, let's, uh, let's pray and get into the Word tonight. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come and receive from your Word. We thank you, Father, for all the literally thousands of people that hear us over uh, Internet television as it goes out th around the world. Father, we know we have viewers and we have listeners that are in China and Europe and literally all over the world. And so we thank you for the opportunity that we have to minister your Word and Father, we just believe that the Holy Spirit has absolute free course here tonight. We believe that He is truly the teacher of the church. And so, Father, we just turn this over to Him to speak through us here tonight. We just thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, as I said, going to be a little different. Uh, maybe something you've never quite heard or seen before, but that's okay. Uh, let's go to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, and there's a lot of good things here in James chapter 5, and I could teach a week right on just this one chapter, but I um, want to key in on a couple of things here. Verse uh, 14, now remember here, as this is being written, James is writing to Christians. He's not writing to the world, He's not writing to unbelievers. He's writing to Christians. He says, is there any sick among you Christians? The implication to me is there really ought not be any sick among you Christians. <laughs> you know, after all, Jesus bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases. By his stripes we were healed. Hallelujah, we ought to be healed. But he still says, he, see, think about James. Here's the thing you need to understand about James. James is a pastor. He's also the Lord's half-brother. In other words, he and Jesus had the same mother, okay, uh, so he grew up in that household. He saw Jesus live his life day in and day out. He understood and knew about the love of God and about ministry and about the, the things that Jesus was called to do. So he has a heart of compassion. And this is what I want us to, to look at here tonight. Is there any sick among you? There's compassion there. You really ought not be sick, but praise the Lord. If there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Now the word save there is the Greek word sozo. Save, deliver, heal, protected, made whole, spirit, soul, body, financially and socially. So it covers every area. And healing is one of them. He'll heal the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. If he's committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now here's the verse I really wanted to get to. Couldn't leave the other one unsaid. But we're getting to verse 16. Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. All right? But now notice that. Confess your faults one to another. There is a church, large church, that believes in confession of sin to the priest. Okay? Now we know that our confession of sin is to the Lord. I like what Brother Copeland has always said. Don't run from God when you sin, run to Him. And I've got a teaching I'm going to have to do here for too long on repentance. Repentance, I heard Brother Keith Moore say this recently and it just struck my thinking. Repentance is a gift. It is a gift. Repentance is something that people look at and go, oh, that's hard, that's harsh, that I have to repent, that I have to indicate that I've changed the direction of my life. You know. Why don't you just leave me alone let me do my thing? No. We need to repent. We need to confess our faults. Now the thing is, we're not to confess sin to one another to be, con you know, to be uh, cleansed of sin. We do that to the Lord. That's unscriptural. To confess our sin to one another. But we do confess our faults to one another. So I want to confess some faults to you. That's why it's going to be a little unusual. 
because I've been in the ministry now a long time. <laughs> I was ordained in 1977. So I've been, I've been around a little while, and I've seen some things. And the Lord has directed me to do a few things, some of which I have not done. That's a fault. Now, actually, you could argue it's a sin, but praise the Lord, he cleanses me from all unrighteousness. <laughs> Hallelujah, because I repent, okay? But it is a fault, and it's something that I think we ought to do. See, a lot of people say, and, and, and you know, believe me, pastor was teaching recently about, you know, folks that say, well, you just have a righteousness, uh, you know, a sin consciousness. You can't go around saying that you've sinned because, you know, that gives you a sin consciousness. No, when you sin, you've sinned. Okay? If you have a fault, you have a fault. <laughs> what you do with it is the difference. I can have a righteousness consciousness because I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Absolutely. I know wherein my righteousness comes. And I can understand that, and I can know that, and I can rejoice about that, but that doesn't mean I don't repent. It doesn't mean I don't confess my faults. So we're gonna, I'm going to do that tonight. And don't get all freaked out. I'm not going to, you know, it's not like I've had any affairs or anything. I haven't. <laughs> Never would. But praise the Lord, I have something in ministry that I need to, have really been needing to deal with <clears throat> for quite a while. And... Um, I will say this, this came out of the ICFM convention that I went to in this past April. So I've been meditating on this since April. I, I'm like Brother Hagin, I don't like do anything quick. You know, if the Lord deals with you about something, pray about it, meditate on it. Let it kind of gel up in you what you need to do. And so, this is part of what I need to do. So let's look at a couple more scriptures. Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter 11, this is one we've heard quite a bit, and, and I will say this, this is a very instructive set of information for young ministers. If you know any young ministers that are in there, particularly in their 20s, okay, this is something they need to know, all right? Um, Verse 29 of, of Romans chapter 11. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Now that's good old King James. And I like the King James. But I looked at this in a lot of other translations. And another translation that I really like, it, as you know, because I've mentioned it before, is God's Word translation. That's in Esword. And I really like it. It says that basically, and I, I'm paraphrasing here because I don't have it right in front of me. All I got is my King James here, my good old Brother Hagin. Bring the Bible here. <laughs> but the gifts and calling of God are without repentance is really talking about the fact gift is the Greek word charisma, which is spiritual gift or supernatural gift. You can put it that way. And the calling here is literally the word calling, meaning what God calls you to do. So if God calls you to do something, he's not going to change his mind. I like that's what the, one of the things that God's Word edition says, is he just doesn't change his mind about it. So God called me to do something many years ago, and he hadn't changed his mind about it. Okay? But I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. I flat refused. Now, what's that called? Rebellion. <laughs> Rebellion will not serve you well. Okay? But it's something that the Lord asked me to do. Well, he didn't ask me. told me to do. I'm trying to, I'm trying to sugarcoat it a little bit, but I can't. I've got to <laughs> put it out there the way it's supposed to be. He told me to do, and I just said no. Now, telling the Lord no is not a good idea. It just didn't. <laughs> but that's what I did. So I want to give you just a little bit of background on this. <clears throat> I feel funny doing this, but I saw myself doing this. <laughs> I got to be obedient. Hi there. My name's Bill Bailey. I know I've been at Faith and Victory Church now for, what, probably 27 years <laughs> since 1988. So it feels funny introducing myself, but I want you to look at me. This is what I saw in the Spirit when I said that. I want you to look at me like you've never met me before in your life. 
Okay? Hi there. I'm Bill Bailey. I was born November 30th, 1955. Now that puts me squarely in the middle of the last century. Hallelujah. And if those of you that are writing down and figuring out on a piece of paper uh, know that that means that November 30th of this year I'll be 60. Glory to God. That'll make you think right there. <laughs> but anyway, but I mean, I'm 60 and spry, you know what I mean? Sharp of mind and eye, praise the Lord. But anyway, I was born November 30th, 1955. I was born again April the 6th, 1969. Now, this is a funny story, and I'm going to just tell you real quick, short, funny story. I, was, I came up charismatic after I got, you know, born again and, and down the road a little bit into the 70s. And uh, we had a song that we liked to sing. Liked to sing it all the time. And basically the song was, it was on whatever day somebody touched me. And you're supposed to say what day it was. Whether it was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever. And so they'd sing that song. And if you didn't know the day, you had to say, or you know, your turn to sing was, it was on, you know, I don't know what day it was, but somebody touched me, okay? And this was just something. And so I got kind of frustrated saying, I don't know what day it was. You know, I mean, I remember it, that it happened, but I didn't know the day. And so I sought the Lord. I said, Lord, show me where I got bored again. It's funny what you do when you're young and dumb, you know? <laughs> so I was a young Christian. I said, Lord, I want to know when I was born again. And he showed me in my spirit. I did not have an open vision. I'm going to define my terms here. An open vision means I'm looking out of my regular physical eyes and I see into the spirit realm. That was not the case. But in my spirit, in my heart, I saw myself in my mom and dad's bedroom at the lake where we live. And I heard myself talking to my dad. And the, the, the occasion was, this was on April the 6th, 1969. I was probably, what, around 16 years old, thereabouts. And uh, I know you math people, you'll, you can tell me right off, but I, I, math and I have a passing acquaintance. <laughs> you know, I mean, math to me is, is like a mystical incantation that occasionally comes out the same way twice but rarely. Okay, that's me and math. <clears throat> so, I, you know, I couldn't put my finger on when it was, and I didn't know the date, and, but I saw in my spirit, the Lord showed it to me, there I was at that young age, I go to my parents' bedroom, the way things work, I lived upstairs, they lived downstairs, and had their own bedroom off the kitchen area there, <clears throat> and uh, our custom was, I would get ready upstairs, get dressed, put on my suit and tie, you know, good Baptist. And uh, I would come downstairs and I would sit in the living room for a while. But then as mom and dad got dressed and got really pretty close to ready, fully dressed, ready to go, get in their Bible, I would usually go into the bedroom and just talk to them. So this was one of those occasions. I went into the bedroom, I was talking, and I said, Hey, Dad, this morning I'm going to go shake the preacher's hand. Well, Dad being wise, said, what does that mean? Well, you know, I'm going to shake the preacher's hand. I'd seen this my whole life. And so, uh, he said, but what does it mean you're going to shake the preacher's hand? Well, it means that I believe Jesus Christ is Lord, and I believe God raised him from the dead. Bam! I was born again. Happened right then. Right there in his bedroom. He said, okay, you can go shake the preacher's hand now. Wise man. So that morning, Sunday morning, I went down. You know, a preacher preached something. I don't even know what he preached. Really wasn't paying attention to the truth. But he preached something. And as soon as it was over with, man, I got up like a shot. I walked down, shook his hand. Well, you know, according to Baptist, you're, you're born again at that point. Now, that's not entirely true. They also turn you around, make you face the congregation, and say, who would like to vote brother in to the church? And I always wondered, what if the vote went the other way? <laughs> you know, but that's what I was used to as a Southern Baptist. You know, we'd, we'd like to vote, brother. Yes, I, I believe we should vote. Yes, second. You know, people raised hands. It was carried. Hallelujah. 
I'd made it. Now, I still had to go through class, and I had to get all my books in order, and I had to get a new Bible, and there was a lot of other things to do, but, you know, I was official. I was Southern Baptist. Hallelujah. That was April 6, 1969. Now, September 30th, 1973, I want you to notice the date here. September 30th, 1973 is prior to November the 10th of 1973. I got that figured out. But September the 30th, 1973, they nominated me and ordained me a deacon. I hadn't even received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, you know, that's pretty much unscriptural. But this was the Baptist church. All right, so get, cut them some slack. So anyway, so I was ordained a deacon. I was the youngest deacon at that time ordained into that church. This was the first Baptist church in Denton, North Carolina. I lived in Denton. Don't anymore. <laughs> Hallelujah. But anyway, baptism of the Holy Ghost, November the 10th, 1973. Now, interestingly, I won't tell the whole story because it'd take a while, but basically the short version is that a friend of mine had a friend who was coming to visit him at NC State University. I had gone to visit this other friend, the first one, Matt, uh, and I was at his apartment in Raleigh. And this other friend of Matt's was going to come down and was going to take us to a meeting. He said, hey, you want to go to a meeting? Well, hey, man, I'm fired up, turned on Christian. You know, I'm, I'm ready to go. Hey, I said, a, a, a Christian meeting? Yeah. Oh, praise the Lord. What is it? The Full Gospel Businessmen's International Convention in Raleigh. Okay. Had no idea what that was. So I went to that meeting, and there were... There were thousands of people in this meeting. It was huge. I'd never been to a meeting that big. And so I go in and I sit down and, you know, actually when I first walked in, there wasn't any place to sit. And so, I, you know, there was this person sitting there that said, you, would you like my seat? And it was, they were older than I was. And I said, oh, no, that's fine. So I ended up sitting on the floor. I could do that back then because <laughs> I was too young. But anyway, I sat on the floor and... Uh, George Otis spoke. Now, George Otis, if you don't know, uh, was a NASA engineer that worked on the moonshot program, Apollo program, and uh, he worked down in Houston at, at that time, and then had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and was going around giving his testimony, which is what full gospel is men do, is go around and give their testimony. So he, not, he didn't just give his testimony. He took his Bible and he opened it up and just went through the entirety of the Scripture, as far as I could tell as a Southern Baptist, about the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, I kept looking at my Bible and I thought, you know, those, I've read my Bible through several times. Those Scriptures were not there. <laughs> Particularly this tongue stuff. Because our church didn't teach against tongues. We were literally... I'm going to show you a scripture. Acts chapter, uh, I believe it's, I did not plan to do this. But Acts chapter, uh, is it 19 really? It's the scratch. Now see, I'm doing what? I'm doing what pastor does. <laughs> pastor said, where's that scripture I'm looking for? <laughs> and we don't know what it is. And we're out there back there going, a clue, a hint. Give me something. It's about the, the, uh, did not know whether there be a Holy Ghost. It's in Acts, I believe it's, it may be 19. It's either 19. Two, three, two. two, all right, hallelujah. Still got it, glory to God. <laughs> Acts 19, let's look at that. And it came to pass when Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast, upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Now, Ephesus was in the south. Just want to let you know. Uh, and he found certain disciples. He said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Now, there's where I was talking, you know, with this guy, George Otis, was preaching. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said to him, we've not so much heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said, well, wait a minute. <laughs> where were you baptized in? They said, under John's baptism. So they were Baptists, and they were in the south. They were Southern Baptists. <laughs> which is what I was. And I was in the same boat. I had not heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. Literally, it was God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Ghost. 
And we don't know anything about him. He's mysterious. But that's okay. He's part of the Godhead. Oh, that's all I knew. So anyway, I go to this meeting. He shows us all these scriptures, of which this was one of them. And I thought, man, I'm just like these guys. I don't even know there is a Holy Ghost. And then he gets to the point of Acts chapter 2 where he talks about they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and spoke in other tongues. I went, what is other tongues? I did not know what that was. <laughs> so he got through preaching, and he said, well, there's too many people here and you know, we had people, sit, like I said, sitting in the floor and all that. He said, nobody can really get clear to come down front. So just where you're at, stand up. Well, back then, even on the floor, I could stand up like, bing. I was pretty fit back then. Anyway, so I stood up. And I'm standing there going, well, I want to receive this. I don't know what it is, but it's Bible. I saw it in the Bible. And one thing about Baptists, they believe the Bible. They may not know what it says, but they believe the Bible. <laughs> So since I'd seen in the Bible, all of my teaching was, if God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Now actually, God said it, that settles it. I believe it. <laughs> it's really the truth. But our bumper stickers were the other way around. <laughs> so anyway, there I was, standing up. He said, now pray this prayer. I thought, all right. So I prayed the prayer. Soon as I got through praying that prayer, something hit me. From the top of my head, it shot all the way down to the soles of my feet. And if I'd have had enough Holy Ghost sense, I'd have fallen. But I was standing there rocking like this, trying to keep from falling. And I thought, oh no, what have I gotten myself involved in? Is this one of them weird cults? And I thought, what am I supposed to do? And he said, now just open your mouth and begin to praise the Lord in tongues. And I was showing what I'm talking to him. And I started speaking in tongues. I thought, oh no. I've gone off the deep end. So I literally thought I had lost it. And I, I, I knew he'd gone over all these scriptures, but I immediately forgot all the scriptures. And so I turned to Matt's friend, who was enjoying all this immensely, because he knew he was going to get me and Matt. <laughs> you, know? you know, Matt was Quaker, I was Baptist. He was like, I'm going to get him. So Matt's sitting there, he's, he's looking at this whole thing, just blinking his eyes, like, what in the world is all this about? So I turned to this other guy and I said, can you give me any scriptures? He said, here you go. Gave me a sheet of paper with all these scriptures on them. Now it was mimeographed. That shows you how old it was. But it was mimeographed, blue on white. And I took it and I put it in my Bible. I'm going to study this out. And I immediately went back to my church. Now, well, I'm shortening the story too much. Matt didn't receive that night. We went home home to his apartment. And I said, what do you think? Oh, I don't know. I said, do you want what I got? He goes, I don't know. I said, well, let's pray. So, man, I'm, you know, I am so charged. I was, it was like electricity shooting through my page. You know, I was like, Ugh. so there wasn't any sleeping that night anyway. So I'm sitting on one bunk, he's sitting on the other bunk, and I'm just praying in the Holy Ghost. And he's looking at me like, what in the world? He said, what is that? I said, I don't know. He said, am I supposed to do it? I don't know. Should I do it? I don't know. I said, but let's just pray. Okay. I said, you want it, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you want the shirt? Yeah. I said, all right. So I'm laying hands on him, and I'm praying. I had no idea what I was doing. I was sitting here, it was stupid. I was just, ah, and praying in the Holy Ghost. He's like, okay. So I said, did you get anything? <laughs> we, were, we were a mess, I'm telling you. But somehow or another, I feel like Brother Hagin, some way, somehow, <laughs> by hook or crook, crook, he got filled with the Holy Ghost that night. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, my. So we started an adventure, he and I. And I took those scriptures and I read them and I studied them. Now, here's what you got to know about me at the time. Like I said, I was the youngest deacon in the church. I was highly respected. College student, you know. And pastor at that time let me preach on Sunday nights. Didn't have the Holy Ghost, but I preached, you know. And I usually preached on Second Coming, because that's all I really wanted to study. Anyway, so I would preach on that, and everybody would go, okay, whatever. And, you know, we're talking the 70s. So I go that back to Denton, and I told my pastor, Pastor, 
Can I preach Sunday night? Sure, Brother Bill. So I got my Bible and I got my sheet of mimeograph notes and I preached the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He's sitting back there. Now you got Herbert Baker. He's gone on to be with the Lord. But Herbert Baker was this skinny, scrawny guy. He was a missionary to Brazil. Spoke fluent Portuguese. White hair. Little skinny guy. He's sitting on the back row going, <gasps> his eyes got as big as saucers. He heard me talk about speaking in other tongues. He said, oh. he was freaked out. So I said, I said, who'd like to receive this tonight? And three ladies got up. And he says, Brother Bill, Brother Bill. All of a sudden, he said, Brother Bill, take him to the back. Take him to the back. Okay, Pastor. I'm a great. I, okay. So I took him to the back. And I prayed over him, you know, to receive the Holy Ghost. And they all spoke in tongues. Well, he, he immediately went, oh my goodness. And he went off and he studied. He came back the next Sunday night. Didn't do it Sunday morning, praise the Lord. But Sunday night he came back and preached while wow, speaking in tongues was of the devil. Now, I want you to think about something. I'm a 16, 17-year-old kid. And I loved my pastor. And my pastor said it was of the devil. And I thought, what if it's really of the devil? I thought I was in some weird occult when it happened. Maybe I, maybe I, should, maybe I shouldn't do this. And so I, the people gave me books. Why well, speaking in tongues with the devil? He gave me tracts, all kinds of stuff. And I mean, as a kid, I was inundated with people wanting me to stop. But I, I got hit by a lightning bolt from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Something happened. I, something happened. So I said, Lord, now here's the thing. Stepping back a step. I was a very unusual Baptist. Even before I received baptism, Holy Ghost. I talked to the Lord and he talked back. Okay? I didn't know you weren't supposed to do that. Okay? So I'd ask him questions, he'd answer me. So I said, Lord, what about this? It's okay. It's what I got in my spirit. It's okay. I, Lord, now I said, he said it's in the scripture, right? I said, yeah. But I said, I just, I got to know, I got to know, I got to know. Well, here's the thing, as a, as a young, 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 super young Christian, my knowing was I had to hear something from the outside or I had to feel something. You know what I'm saying? I was not educated in spiritual things. And so I said, Lord, I need some kind of proof. So here's what I'm going to do. Now, I'd gone back, this, is, this happened in Raleigh. I went back to Raleigh, I was sitting under a tree at the NC State campus outside from Matt's apartment. And I said, Lord, I'm going to pray in tongues one more time. This is it. And you need to show me if this is real. Quite a challenge for a kid talking to God. So I said, here we go. And I started speaking in tongues. And there was one word that was like lit up in lights, and I heard it, and I, it just stuck in my head. And that was the word lingui. I said, lingui, okay? I said, all right, what's happening? So I thought, well, what do I do? I went back to my high school, and I went to our library, and I started looking through books, and lingui, I mean, I didn't even know how it's spelled. But they, they had this big wooden stand with a giant monster dictionary on it. They had all the word derivations in it. And so I'm looking through, and I found the word lingui. It was Latin. And it means the tongue. So I went, okay, Lord, that's, that's, that's it. That's proof. That's where I was at, okay? The word was enough. <laughs> but I needed, a word, I needed a word that I could remember and go look it up in the dictionary and find out that it meant the same as the word tongue and actually the word linguistics comes from it. But that was my proof. And so, man, I threw away the tracks. I threw away the books where they were trying to get me convinced. I read the scripture, and I was, man, I was charismatic, crazy-matic, totally. And so I went to every meeting I could go to. I did everything I could think of. And before too long, because I am one of those people who won't compromise <laughs> just by nature, I got to where I was preaching a little too hard in the Baptist church. 
with my buddy Ted Potts, who was youth leader, that I'd gotten filled with the Holy Ghost because he felt like he needed something else. And I said, I know what you need. And he ended up speaking in other tongues, and he got all fired up and excited, and we got a hold. He and I went to High Point, North Carolina, to where the Wesleyan you know, Academy is. There at the end of that little block is a building that I think is they now use for their food service. Little building there. Used to be a Christian bookstore. And he and I would go, we would just go traveling at Christian bookstores everywhere we could. We went to High Point, we went to this little Christian bookstore. I don't know if it was a Wesleyan Christian bookstore, but it was a Christian bookstore. And I went in there, and there was a book called What is Faith? by Kenneth E. Hagin. <laughs> and I picked up that book, and I read the book standing there in the bookstore. And Ted came over and said, you shouldn't be reading the book in the bookstore. You should buy it. I said, okay. Uh... This is good. You've got to read this. So we bought the little book, took it back to Denton, and he devoured that book. Ted just, he borrowed it and just read it, read it, read it, read it, read it. Well, before too long, we were preaching the Word of Faith. Preaching it in the Southern Baptist Church. This is where we received the left foot fellowship from among the Baptists. And we went out and started a church in Denton. I mean, you know, they literally kicked us out. They told us, actually, they were a little bit nicer than that. They didn't kick us out like excommunicate us. They told us we couldn't teach anymore. We couldn't hold office in the church. We weren't supposed to talk to anybody. But we could come. Well, we were young and turned on to the word. And so we said, okay, we're, we're not going to do this. We're just going to go down the, the road. Look, Denton is a small town. 900 people. So you couldn't get very far. You know what I'm saying? So... A little ways down the road, we found a building for rent. We rented it for 100 bucks a month. Hallelujah. This was in the 70s. Don't you love it? And so we rented a little building, and we started having meetings Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Started having church. And we, we organized the church. We got it all set up. Did all the legal work. And they ordained me and ministered July 7th, 1977. All right? Now, that was July of 77. Later that year, this is where I'm getting to, I'm confessing my fault, okay? Later that year, I went to a Bible study. And it was at a pastor's house. Well, he wasn't a pastor then, he's a pastor now, but wasn't a pastor then. But I went to his house and he had a Bible study in his house. We did a lot of that back then. Bible studies in houses, okay? Because there weren't a whole, well, there weren't any that I knew of, word churches, other than ours, <laughs> that we had started which we called Covenant Faith Ministries. We originally called it Latter Rain Christian Fellowship, but we eventually changed the name to Covenant Faith Ministries. And so, got ordained by them, had our meeting, happy as a clam, go to this local Bible study. And there was a guy there that I had never met. As far as I know, I never saw him again. He just came that one time to teach the Bible study. Well, instead of teaching like we were used to, he starts moving in the Holy Ghost. Well, I'd had a little exposure to that, but not a lot. And so he says, he says uh, this brother points to me. Come up here. So I go, okay. So I stand up. And he looks at me. He says, the Lord says, as big as you are on the outside, you're bigger on the inside. Well, you know, part of me went, Really? <laughs> slightly insulting, you know what I'm saying? As big as you are on the outside, you're bigger on the inside. But that's not really the way I took it. I went, really? Oh, cool. It really struck me. And then he said, the Lord wants to minister to you. He laid his hand on my head, and I hit the floor. I mean, I don't remember falling. I was on the floor. And I was not only on the floor, I was out. I was unaware anybody else was in the room. <clears throat> and something very unusual happened. I saw the Lord. But it wasn't an open vision. It was in the Spirit. And I saw the Lord. I saw His head. I saw His shoulders. I saw His arms. Everything else around Him was like a cloud of white. But I saw Him, and He said, I've called you and anointed you into a healing ministry. And I thought, Lord... I don't want it. Now, I'm laying there on the floor, and I'm talking to the Lord. 
He said, I've called, he said it again, I called you and anointed you into a healing ministry. Now, hold out your hand. Now, here's the funny thing. I held out my hand, but I didn't know if I was doing it physically or just in the spirit. You know what I mean? It was the strangest thing. I still to this day don't know if I was laying on the floor with my arm like this. But to me, I was holding out my hand. And the Lord touched my hand, the center of my hand, and he says, now, when you're ministering the word, now remember, I was teaching off and on, but not by any means a lot. <clears throat> I went on radio in 1976, so this is a year after I'd gone on radio. But he touched my hand and it started to burn. And he said, now you are to lay hands on people that need to receive their healing and say, and he was very specific, he said, and say, in the name of Jesus. That's it. No teaching, no going on and on, just in the name of Jesus. Well, I thought, okay. Now, remember, I'm in the Spirit, and here's the Lord, and I'm going, okay. And I'm feeling my hand burn and going, what do I do with this? Well, I didn't know what to do with it, and so I said, Lord, what am I supposed to do? He said, I want you to read uh, Acts chapter 19, which is where we just were a minute ago. Acts chapter 19, and specifically, uh, verse, let's start in verse 10. Uh, this they continued by the space of two years, so that all that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. So we've got to preach the word, absolutely. Both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. And, and the Lord showed me that and said, I'm giving you a special anointing that is tangible. Now, after this, I heard Brother Hagin talk about when he received a special anointing. Now, I've had people ask me that I've shared this with, did this happen before or after you heard Brother Hagin share what happened to him? I don't honestly know, truly. I don't know whether I already heard it on a tape or whatever. All I can tell you is it happened to me. And it was different. He didn't lay hands on, uh, you know, his finger in both hands. He just did on my right hand. And he gave me a slightly different instruction. But he did that. And I read the scripture and I thought, special miracles, special miracles. Well, I did a little study on this. And Brother Hagin actually has a teaching on this about special miracles. And talks about those that are called into a special healing ministry having a unique anointing in that area. And he talked about the fact that the anointing is tangible. It is real. It is actual. And it is transferable, which is why when we lay hands on claws, those claws can contain that anointing and take that anointing elsewhere. And Brother Hagin's got a big teaching on this. You can go check it out and read it or hear it on tape. But, uh, and by the way, I will say this, and I mentioned this to pastors as well. Uh, I have pretty much all of Brother Hagin's teaching on MP3. And so if you're interested, I could get you copies of different things. But anyway... So I listened to this about the healing anointing and about it being tangible, about it being a power. And he even said this, and I found this fascinating because I, I was so into this, studying this. He said, I don't know why it is exactly, but the tangible anointing seems to transfer into cloth, but not paper. I don't know why that is. But there, he said, talk to him, not me, that it was a cloth, and this is, he said, and this is the scripture, handkerchiefs are aprons, cloth-based, tangible, anointing can be transferred using that. So I thought, well, all right, Lord, uh, I still don't want to do this. But he didn't say any more to me about it, and I got up, and I went home. Later that week, we went back to our church, our little church here in Denton. And I shared this. I was pretty excited, although a little reticent. I wasn't sure I was, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I was so young and Lord. And so I shared this and I said, so, now as I shared it, my hand began to burn. I said, is there anyone here? I said, my hand is beginning to burn. Is there anyone here that, that needs to receive their healing? And this guy jumped up off the back chair and comes running up. And I knew him because I knew everybody there. It was only about 12 of us. <laughs> I knew who he was, and I knew he was from uh, 
uh, Ashbury area. <clears throat> but he says, yes. Okay. So I thought, well, I know exactly what I'm supposed to do. I just laid one hand on his forehead. I said, in the name of Jesus. And he went, bam, hit the floor like a sack of potatoes. And I went, okay. And then there was somebody else came up, and I ministered to them. They went out. Somebody else went up. They went out. And so after that, this guy, whose name was Neil, was his first name, Neil jumps up and runs. I thought, what is up? He ran to the bathroom. And the next thing you know, I hear screaming coming from the bathroom. It's God! He comes running back. And I said, what's, what's gone, Neil? He said, I had a growth. Now this, bear with me here. Get a little, little technical. He had a growth on his testicles. And it was a knot. And it was growing larger and larger and larger. When I laid hands on him, that thing went bam and was gone. Instantly gone. He felt it lay on the floor, jump up, go to check himself, checked himself, and his testicles were normal. And he jumped up and ran back, I'm healed. He was just freaking out, excited. Well, you know what it did to a young Baptist boy? Scared the daylights out of me. Because I didn't know anything about this stuff. I well, didn't grow up in it. I didn't have any exposure to it. I'd never been to a meeting where anybody was doing any of this. And so I said, whoa, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Well, ever since then, the Lord's been dealing. What are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about that? How, how long has it been now? Almost 40 years. What are you going to do about that? So here's why I'm confessing my fault. I should have been obedient. Now here's the thing. He gave me later instructions. He didn't quit talking to me. A lot of things happened. Now I didn't lay hands on folks and say in the name of Jesus and do all those things. I didn't have the tangible anointing burning, but I preached the word and I laid hands on folks and people got healed. And there was, at one time, I walked in a very strong supernatural ministry such that I've had literally the blind healed in my ministry several times. Went to Jamaica and, uh, and preached down there. Had people healed there of crippling arthritis, instantly healed. All kinds of things happen. Supernatural ministry, yes, and I've seen it and I've had words from the Lord and all kinds of things. But in the back of my mind, there's always been this little thing. What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? And every so often, I've had, in, right here in this church, I've had situations where I'd be sitting there and somebody would come up for healing and pastor would call Brother Benny. Benny, come up here and pray with me. And I'd, I'd be going, oh, I've I got to go up there. I've got to go up there. I, no, I, I don't want to do that. And I'd resist it. And pastor didn't call me. Because here's the thing about the Lord. He won't embarrass you, but he will deal with you. He'll deal with you. And that's what he did. He dealt with me. All these years he dealt with me about it. Dealt with me about it. I went down to the ICFM convention in April. <laughs> nobody called me out. Nobody laid hands on me. It wasn't anything like that. But I'm sitting there in the meeting listening. And the Lord said, what are you going to do about that? I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I repent. I should have been obedient this whole time. Here's what he said when I did that. He said, son, how many people would have received their healing had you been obedient. And I said, oh Lord, I never thought of it that way. It never hit me. And I thought to myself, well, I know God's merciful and I know His grace and I know His mercy. I know that there are people who got healed other ways that might have been healed through this healing ministry. And as He dealt with me about it, and I sat there, I told him, I said, here's what I'll do. I will tell the folks at Faith and Victory. And if you see fit to use me in that ministry, because here's the thing, I'll say this, and this is why I was talking about this would help young ministers. If the Lord deals with you about something like this and you stop on purpose and you say, I don't want to do that, 
the prompting will get less. And he'll get a little quieter about it. And the tangible anointing will be less. And finally, you won't feel it. Okay? That's what happens. Now, remember the scripture we read, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He doesn't change his mind. He has never changed his mind about me being in the healing ministry. Never. Because he made that decision, and that's the way it is. That's God. But I was holding out. I didn't want to do it. And he said, I don't care what you want to do. You need to do it. So I said, all right, Lord, here's what I'll do. I will confess this. Confess your faults. That's what I'm doing. Confess this to the, to the body there. And uh, just be available. I'm available. If he wants to use me in that fashion, I'm available. Now, I have seen, I, I've, I've been in meetings like Catherine Kuhlman. I was an usher in one of her meetings, and I saw tremendous miracles. Like I said, I've seen the supernatural in my life. It's not that I've been completely insulated from it. But I just didn't want to participate so much. You know what I'm saying? There's just something in me that was like, I don't want to be the center of attention. I don't want people looking to me. I already told you the story one time about the, the lady, because I was on the radio, she called me up and said, Brother Bill, will you pray for me to receive for healing? And I was like, oh, Lord. I was cooking supper. I had, I had steak out there. I just put out in the plate. And I was just ready to eat it. And I was like, oh, man. Was not feeling spiritual at all. She calls up and, and says, will you pray? And I thought, well, be instant in season, out of season. I quote that scripture myself a lot. Be instant in season, out of season. So I said, yeah, okay, uh, you know, according to the word of God, Jesus brought sickness, carried her diseases. I prayed a Mickey Mouse prayer. I mean, I didn't blow her off, but it was kind of like, yeah, you know, half, half attempt. <laughs> and so, hung up the phone, went back to my supper. I was fine. One month later, I go hold a meeting in Lexington, North Carolina, which I used to do back, back then a lot. And uh, this was at the Holiday Inn. And we had the meeting. And this lady walks up to me and says, Hi, Brother Bill. I called you on the phone and you prayed for me. I thought, oh, Lord, this is that lady. And I immediately felt guilty, miserable guilty. I said, well, sister, praise the Lord. What God heal you of? I was blind. I went, what? And the lady next to her said, yeah, I can say it. she's been blind her whole life. <laughs> Standing there going, praise the Lord. And it was like the Lord was saying, see there, see there. Little Mickey Mouse prayer, and this lady gets healed of blindness. And I felt about that big. And the Lord said this to me in my spirit, real loud. I didn't hear it with the ears on the side of my head. But he said, see, it's not you. It's not your prayer. I just need you to be an instrument. And this is what he's been dealing with me about since that meeting. Just be there. Be an instrument. And I literally, I wondered to myself, if as I mentioned this tonight, if I would feel the tangible anointing, but I don't. Praise the Lord. Y'all are healed and whole. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I thought about talking to pastor and saying, hey pastor, can I have one of the healing meetings, maybe. I said, no, I'm just going to do what the Lord told me and confess my fault and just wait. Don't do anything fast. Now, don't wait 40 years to obey God either. Bless your darling heart and my darling heart. We ought, to, we ought to be obedient. We ought to be willing and obedient. But, you know, it's like Brother Hagin. He was willing... I mean, he was obedient, but he wasn't willing in that particular situation he talked about. I need to get willing and obedient. Well, I am now willing, and I am obedient. If he wants to use me in healing ministry, Lord, have at it. But it's nothing I'm going to work up. It's nothing I'm going to try. I'm just going to be available. I will say this. I have, the Lord has dealt with me quite a bit. We see a lot of supernatural things here at Faith and Victory Church. We really do. Prayer claws go out here. Pastor's got an anointing to lay hands on those claws, and 
miracles, miracles are happening. We see that. We see blend to get a new heart. We see all kind. We see financial miracles. We see people who work doing well financially. All of that turn around. And I'm sorry, but a lot of us, I think, take it for granted. Well, that's just the way it is at Faith and Victory. Well, yeah, praise the Lord, that's good. But praise God, we ought to be thankful that the power of God is in manifestation, that God's willing to move and do some things. And so I believe, this is just me, but I believe that those of us who have been reticent to do what God's told them to do and act on what God's told them to, to say aren't going to do that anymore. We're going to step out. That's what I want to do, is step out and do what God's called me to do. Now, he told me back in August of 1980, proclaim the word of faith, be a showcase of ministry, train people to feel the word of God. I have meditated on that. I have studied that. To the best of my ability, I've done that. And I'm like Reddy Harrison. When I heard him say that he would never get out of the helps ministry, something in my heart went, yes, me too. I will never get out of the helps ministry. I'm as happy as a clam back there running the, the video. That is a ministry. I'm telling you what. We're reaching thousands of people every month with video and audio that's coming out of this church. We look at small groups of folks here and go, well, uh, man, we're doing some powerful ministry out there around the world. So I, I'm happy back there doing that. But the Lord's called me to step out in some areas. And so I'm just making myself available. That's all I can say. And I'll just do what he just says to do when he says to do it. And uh, I ran a little bit longer than I wanted to. I thought it was going to be short, but, you know, I have a hard time being short-winded. <laughs> I'm like John Osteen, the short-winded shall speak again. Well, I, I need to get a little more revelation of that. But praise the Lord, I, I trust you received something out of this. I certainly did because I was obedient to what the Lord told me to do. And it was hard. You never want to admit a fault. But I am human, and I make mistakes. And this was a long dumb mistake. But I repent, and now I'm getting on the right road. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, PO Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.